Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Hal Whitehead. He's professor in the Department of Biology at Dalhousie University in, in Canada. His work focuses mainly on the behavior, ecology, population biology and conservation of two species of deep diving whale, the sperm whale and the northern bottlenose whale. He and his team have ongoing research projects on sperm whales in the Eastern Pacific and Atlantic, on the northern bottlenose whales of uh, Nova Scotia and pilot whales of Nova Scotia as well. They spend periods of weeks at sea on board ocean-going sailing boats collecting acoustic, visual, photographic, genetic and oceanographic data on these species. So, Dr. Whitehead, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank great. You. So, the, the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, uh, how and why did you decide to study these species of whale? I mean, is, is there something special about them in terms of their sociality? Is there something that by studying them we can get a better grasp of the evolutionary history of a particular trait, for example, or something like that? Yes, um, for, for, for the um, especially the sperm whale, but also the pilot whale, yes. they are matrilineal, and what that means is that the, um, the 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 daughters, and as well as um, um, in the pilot whales, the sons uh, typically stay with their mothers through their lives. Right? So you have a social system where uh, each female is closely surrounded in the same group as their female relatives. Mm -hmm. um, and this sets up a, 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 a number of um, really, for me, interesting and for them important um, uh, 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 situations such as it, it, it means they're doing everything together with their close kin and that makes coordination cooperation and so on much easier because not only are these animals uh, animals who've known each other since birth mm -hmm. but they're close relatives they said uh, share the same genes uh, uh, and, um, and and that means get translated into the second area which i'm i'm very interested in which is culture what the the information they share right so these animals are not only sharing genes they're sharing culture so they're very closely integrated in that respect and um that makes it really interesting so i i started off with the sperm whale which is uh, interesting all kinds of other ways it's an animal that's extreme um you know, it has the largest brain on earth. It has the strangest distribution of the sexes. The females are in the tropics. The males are in the Arctic and Antarctic and all kinds of other weird stuff. Um, so the sperm whale, it had the matrilineal social system and had all these other things. So that, that was the particular focus. And um, I, I, you know, I, I was like most biologists i'm interested in the comparative method that we can learn by looking at a, 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 a different sets of organisms which are related in some ways and see how whether or not they're related in other ways and so by looking at other uh, matrilineal social systems maybe we could learn about how matrilineal social social systems uh, govern the lives of the animals so we started studying the pilot whales the third species uh, was somewhat different, the northern bottlenose whale. What happened there was, uh, when we uh, initially started studying the sperm whales, we had this uh, theory, and, and others, even my predecessors who studied sperm whales, had this theory that um, the matrilineal social system was a function of the fact that these animals were deep divers. So a female sperm whale is typically diving every 40 minutes and going down about 600 meters to eat, 
deep water squid. Yeah. And yeah. as she does this, she leaves her her young her, 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 her babies at the surface, and they're typically not always, but typically they are accompanied by some other member of their group, right? So you've got this babysitting arrangement which protects the the, the, the calf, and uh, so we. Um, we had been thinking that deep diving itself was a an evolutionary promoter of uh, matrilineality because we assumed it would be easier uh, and we and we have now found that that many of these babysitters are quite close relatives of the uh, of the mother uh, they they may be her sisters or the older siblings of the um, of the of the baby, and, and so that was the theory. Now, northern bottlenose whales were known as deep divers. In fact, even deeper divers than the sperm whales. So we thought, ah, we'll probably find a matrilineal social system here. And so we went out to study them, and um, no. They don't. <laughs> they don't have the matrilineal social system. They have a, it's sort of reversed, where the closest relationships seem to be among the males rather than the females. But the females have a um, ha have a uh, a network of relationships, and it seems that the key difference here is that the bottlenose whales, um, the sperm whales, are generally nomads. They're moving over the ocean, going here and there, wherever they think they can find food. The bottlenose whales live uh, much more um, consistently in particular places. So we study them in a submarine canyon here off Nova Scotia, um, you know, a big canyon, rather like the Grand Canyon, but uh, underwater. And, um, and and when we go there, they're always there. You know, they, they, uh, and that's where they live. And and when the female dives, well, there'll be other females around, not necessarily her relatives, but other females, and the calf can go and be with, be, be with them. So they seem to have another way of getting the babysitting without having the matrilineality. Whereas the sperm whale, they're moving over the oceans; uh, they never know where they're going to be. So it's great to have your close relatives who you can depend on beside you. Okay. Sorry, that was rather long, but that's uh, <laughs> that, that's uh, why we do it and how we do it <laughs> a little bit. Yes. Yeah, there's no problem. Yeah, there's no problem. So, I mean, let me ask you another question. Uh, of course, these would probably vary among these three different types of species, but is there a lot of parental care and investment in these whales? Yes, there is. They are all um, well maternal, right? So they they <laughs> when we're talking about parents, it's the mother. Um, they uh, in all species they suckle their young till about age four, so four years where mother's milk initially just mother's milk and later on their. Um, also using other food, but um, so um, they. But then they um, in this in the pilot whales and the sperm whales. They're you know if they're female. They're with the mother for the rest of their lives while they're both alive. With the uh, northern bottlenose, um, then it becomes more diffuse after the young animal weans. Um, so they are spending a lot of time when they're very young first couple of years with their mother, quite a lot of time in the next couple of years right beside the mother, and then in the sperm and pilot whales, um, the rest of their lives in the same group as that mother. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of care uh, that the mother is giving. In, in all these cases, the father's role, um, and I think uh, typically, uh, not typically, uh, consistently throughout the whales and dolphins, the fathers have no role in raising their offspring. That doesn't mean the males don't. So in, in both the pilot whales and the sperm whales, uh, males, um, in pilot whales, uh, 
the, the, the younger males and, and in, in pilot whales, the older males as well, may um, take quite a role in babysitting and probably in other, other ways of caring for the calf. But these wouldn't be the fathers, these would be uncles and so on, uh, older brothers. Yeah. So there's so so alloparenting happening. Absolutely, alloparenting. This is alloparenting where these, uh, these uh, males, um, as well as females, um, put a, a remarkably, you know, t take a remarkably large role in um, caring for the car. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on kin selection. I mean, these are groups that are tightly genetically related, right? Well, it, it is based on kin selection, yes. So um, the, the babysitter is more likely to be a um, close kin. So, um, but um, in case, it, it's not totally that. So we have cases where there, uh, for one reason or another, there are no close kin. So sometimes, say, the mat matrilineal unit gets really small. Yeah. So it's just, you know, a couple of females. Then what will tend to happen is they will uh, merge with another small unit who, whom they may not be related to at all or pretty distantly related to and form a cohesive union w within which there will be uh, babysitting across the... Um, the kinship line. So yes, it is based on kinship, but no, it isn't totally kinship. Mm -hmm. And is there any of these any of these whales? I mean, the female ones. Any of them go through menopause or not? Um, the, the, there are whales that do go through menopause. At yeah. the moment. Uh, it looks as though if we define menopause as living a large p females living a large part of their lives typically after their last birth then uh, the long fin pilot whale which is the pilot whale we study does not have menopause in that sense although female reproductive rates slow very considerably as they get older its sister species, the short fin, menopause, uh, short fin pilot whale, does have menopause, more or less the same schedule as, as humans, so stopping reproduction in their early 40s, living perhaps into their 70s or 80s. Um, the sperm whale is not, not as clear. We don't. I would say it, it's kind of... The, the, the reproductive rate clearly slows, and in one of the best data sets where uh, whalers went and killed all the animals in a group, um, and then examine them carefully and they did a, this was quite a, a large and bloody operation they uh, found no pregnant females over age I think uh, 42 or so whereas there were quite a lot of you know a lot of older females in the pop in that population they killed as well as animals who were uh, lactating so who were producing milk so that suggests that these older females were taking a part in the communal raising of the, the, the offspring by producing milk, but that they uh, weren't getting pregnant themselves. So the, 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 the story's rather out there with the, with the sperm whales, but certainly with the um, pilot whales, uh, uh, the short fin pilot whales, killer whales and so on, yeah, they, they do have menopause. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about grandmothers in some of these species and uh, I mean that after menopause the females can fulfill the role of grandmothers and also invest in their offsprings, offspring let's say. Yes, yes, there was a recent um, paper that came out showing that. Now, uh, for, for the, the, and that's the way it looks it is with humans that um, the uh, uh, the presence of the older female helps their grand offspring in um, uh, in the first look in 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 the best speed best studied metro uh, menopausal species of, of, of whale which was the um, killer whale uh, where we really have good data, it suggested that there was a very strong mother effect, so that uh, having the older female alive really helped 
her, especially her, her, her sons, who would be themselves of reproductive age, say in their 30s and so, and they did w enormously better if their mother was alive than if she died. And so this would be a mother effect rather than a grandmother effect. But this new paper has shown that there is also a grandmother effect. So it also helps the, the, um, the, the offspring of her daughters um, if she is alive. And uh, with the killer whales, they've you know, shown how this may work because they found that these older females will lead the groups of uh, uh, lead the groups, especially in times when food is scarce. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there's there's good, pretty <laughs> there's good evidence uh, that well there is menopause in some of these species, and uh, it, you know it's fascinating because it's a very rare phenomenon as far as we know, only otherwise found in humans, and uh, and and it yeah. sort of goes against Darwin. Well, you know, you think. Uh, the female should try and reproduce, even if she's not going to be very successful. Get a few more genes out there with some probability rather than sort of giving up. But, um, you know, she's so important. The um, I, I think especially the information she has is so important for her, her sons, her daughters, her grandchildren, and maybe other relatives and, and other relatives that um, yeah it's better for her not to risk that stay alive and and and, and help yeah yeah that information <laughs> we're talking about is culture and we're going to refer to that later on in the interview let me just ask you first uh, i mean how do these whales establish their social networks for example in your work in some papers i read about a multi-level animal societies. I mean, what is that about? And since the, the, the networks that they establish are not simply or only based on kin or kin selection, I mean, how, how does that work? Well, I think it, it, it does work as you, as you suggested at several levels. And um, we don't understand all of this, but we've got um, uh, some information. And the most, if we start at the lowest level, um, the level of the social unit, the matrilineal unit. Um, and and, and our, we have the best information here from a study done by my colleague Shane Giro of the island of Dominica in the Caribbean. And he's got to know... A lot of the island, uh, a lot of the whales there really well, and um, you know he's followed some of them from birth. He uh, has watched them for days and days and days. He um, has really good insight in, into their behaviour, into I, you know, it, the indications of when they are um, being um, is, uh, interacting positively or negatively. And so um, the picture we get from that is the, a, a lot of the basis of that sociality um, comes from when the whales are young. And so they interact clearly heavily with their mothers and then with the, um, the, 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 the social companions of their mothers. And then they, um, uh, as and, and as well as with the other animals who are young at the same time as them, so they're they're, they're peers. And then as they grow, you, it appears that um, other things come into play, such as um, personality. There are some more gregarious animals than others, and the more gregarious you know, have a, a more tightly embedded in the social network. The babysitting system, so who babysits whom, that um, becomes another part of it. Um, there are uh, particular friendships and avoidances. Some, some animals like each other, some don't. Uh, so all this is going on with the social unit. So the, 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 the network has a, a structure, but it changes a bit over time. 
Um, the young males leave their social unit probably in the early teens or so, and uh, so as before they do that, they become increasingly um, on the edge of the social units, and, and then they leave. So then these dynamics are going on at the uh, within unit level. There's a second set of dynamics happening at, b between units. So some units um, seem to be really good friends with each other. They, they spend a lot of time with each other. Um, sometimes these are units which uh, ha have um, distant kinship. So maybe if we go back three or four generations, they share a grandmother, um, I mean, a great, great grandmother. Um, and then um, the um, if you go uh, if you get a social unit becoming too small, it may merge with another social unit, um, and or, you know that this would typically be one that it's good friends with. If it gets too big, it may split into two social units. So you've got these. Um, another social network at the level of the social units. And then above that, and this is the, the side of it that I guess interests me most of all, is we have a, a um, clan structure. So each social unit is a member of a clan, and um, each clan has a distinctive set of behavior. So this is most clearly shown by their, um, the, their vocalizations, their sounds. Sperm whales vocalized by patterns of clicks. So you get click, 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 click. And um, so e e e off the Galapagos, where we first started, uh, found this, <coughs> initially there were two um, clans, so two sets of social units who used the area, and there were the, uh, what we call the regular clan, who tended to go click, 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 or click, 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 and the plus one clan who tend to go click, 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 or click, 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 click. Um, and um, we found that the social units of the different clans did not interact. Even though they were using the same area, sometimes we'd see them on the same day, <laughs> they didn't interact. So you've got kind of, uh, but we also found that the um, social units of the different clans had distinctively different behavior. Their social systems were a little different. The way they looked after calves was a li little different. The way they moved around was a little different. And uh, then that led into ecological effects. They were found in somewhat different areas, even though they overlapped a lot, but the, one of the regular clan tended to be close to the islands. The plus one uh, tended to be a bit further away. <clears throat> and then into reproductive success, this all led into uh, that consistently we'd find more calves with the, with the plus one clan than the regular clan. So, um, uh, we've looked at the genetics of this, and there's no, um, the, 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 there's no uh, indication at all that these are genetically different in any function in the functional genes. Uh, in other words, that uh, they might be incipient subspecies or something like that. In fact, in the sperm whales, what seems to be happening um, again this, the, in this case with I'm being fairly tentative, but it looks like in, in some ways the genes are more mixed up than we might expect, which indicates that the males preferentially mate outside their natal clan. So they're finding a mate or the females are choosing males who were not part of their clan when they were growing up. So um, in, in this case, we've got a cultural system. So these differences between the clans are learned <clears throat> they learn from the young sperm whale, from their mother, from the other females in their group uh, and in their social unit, and um, and these are being propagated through social social learning. And the clans have different behavior, different cultures, mm -hmm. 
so in some sense, we have a multicultural system. And this is true both in the Caribbean and in the eastern tropical Pacific. Yes. So it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's really interesting. I, I'm really interested in the role of culture in animal societies. And it's somewhere, you know, this is a, happened to, just by chance in the animals that I was studying. Well, I, I guess that's partly why I'm really interested in it. But um, I think I would be anyway. And uh, it, uh, it, because they are, well, because it's called St. Patrick, they're in the same area. That makes it a bit easier to distinguish the cultural elements here. Because you can say these animals and these animals are, are doing different things, even though they live in the same area. So it's not a ecological thing that's, that's driving this. It also means you have to have some sort of system where they don't learn across, even though they're in the same area. They're presumably very aware of each other, but they don't learn ac ac across the clan barriers. And uh, how that works, we don't know. It's, it's a fascinating puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. so, uh, and that already uh, points toward uh, some sort of relationship between how they establish their social networks and how their culture works, right? So, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, but, but let me ask you: in the case of whales. What kinds of culture are we talking about here? I mean, what, when you mention that whales have culture, what, behave, what kind of behaviors are you referring to? Well, it's hard for me to list them in, in, in importance for the whales because, um, you know, we see everything through our lenses as humans. And um, and because whales spend most of their time underwater, our lenses aren't terribly good. And um, our best sense for for for, for, for um, uh, understanding the whales is our ears, right? We, because we can, they are very vocal, and we can hear them well um, using underwater microphones. Occasionally we can hear them without them if they're very close, but through underwater microphones we get a good acoustic record of what they're, what they're um, saying. Um, and so that, and, and it's much more easily analyzed, especially the clicks of the sperm whales, than is the, um, the little that we can see. Um, furthermore, we think that these are primarily the, the acoustics is their main sense vision doesn't work very well underwater even if you live there and have evolved eyes and so on for dealing with that the, the issues of light underwater um, a large male sperm whale can, may not be able to see the other end of its body um, but they can hear each other at many kilometers they can convey detailed information acoustically. They can sense their environment acoustically through sonar. So sound is, is what we concentrate on. And um, clearly the different clans and even the different social units and, and, and to a much lesser extent the different individuals have different sets of vocalizations. They, they, they have very strong typical clan um, sounds. I mentioned the plus one and the regular, but the different other clans do. So that we can be with a group of sperm whales for a matter of uh, minutes. We don't even have to see them, and then we can tell, okay, that's this clan or that clan. Um, so that's very obvious to us and probably really important to them, but that's not, we haven't shown that. We've been trying playback experiments where we play back the sounds of their clan, the sounds of the other clan, and try and look for differences in behavior. But it hasn't, you know, this has been a wonderfully effective method to look at the uh, vocalizations of birds and some other species. But we have unfortunately been very successful. And I think part of the reason is, I mean, these are enormously acoustic animals with the largest brain on earth. And I don't think we've fooled them. I mean, I think they hear it and say, oh, this is idiot humans trying to be like us, rather than say, oh, that's the other clan, or that's, oh, one member of our clan's just turned up. 
So um, that has proved to, you know, we haven't got a lot of information that way. But um, we, you know, I, I think the sounds are important to them. And it's possible, but again, we haven't shown this um, in any uh, clear way, that these are symbolic markers. So for them, that sound indicates our clan or the other clan, just in the same way uh, that we, and we, you know, these clans are big. They have thousands of members. Um, so just as, as we have I indicators of our ethnicity, uh, we have symbolic markers like national flags, national dress, dialects, all those things, um, which are important to us and which govern our um, social interactions, our political interactions, and so on. Um, my guess is that the the the, the, uh, the sounds of the whales have have somewhat similar roles in governing some of the social uh, organization at these higher levels, and and uh, you know on the day to day level at the lower levels as well. Um, so there's that side of it. Some of the other things uh, we do know are uh, important for the whales, which differ between the clans, are uh, movements, how they move around the ocean, um, how they uh, have, have, how they, some elements of the social structure. Uh, in these case, in the social structure case, we don't know if these differences are really profound. This is what we have to do because we're of this clan, or it's more of a drift thing. You know, we've it just turns out that we've ended up, you know, so for instance, um, you know, you in Portugal greet each other a different, slightly different way than we do in Canada. And if we went to India, people would greet each other in a really different way. And, and, but those greetings aren't often used as a sign that I'm an Indian or I'm a Portuguese or I'm a Canadian. They're more it's kind of the way it's developed over years. So we have, you know, that kind of drift uh, maybe going on there. Um, so uh, it, it, it is hard for us to get an idea what is important to them, but we'd like to do that. And that's part of the reason we're trying these um, experiments. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me ask you now, because, I mean, before uh, we thought that humans were the only animal that was endowed with uh, culture, that we were the only ones that had culture, nowadays we know that that's not the case. But what about cumulative culture? Because that is still presented as a uniquely human feature or trait. But do whales or other animals exhibit something like cumulative culture? Well, if you, um, you know, obviously it depends a bit how you define cumulative culture. But if you define it as a, a behavior which no animal no single animal could invent on its own. And so the behavior that the animal exhibits is the result of a lot of learning being put together, being then, you know, that's how we get things like human technology and uh, laws and music and so on. Um, I think it's clear that there are some elements of non-human culture which have this and so uh, the complex songs of birds and the complex songs of some whales such as the humpback whale song i i really don't think in either case a nightingale or a humpback whale suddenly went out there and sung their incredibly complex and and, and wonderful songs those songs built up their complexity built up you know as nightingales and humpback whales learned from other animals. So in that sense, yes, they do have community culture. And to a lesser extent in other respects, I think. Um, so for instance, there's the case of uh, the uh, lobtail feeding of humpback whales, um, where in the Gulf of Maine, which is you know, fairly close to where I'm sitting now, um, humpback whales in a, a humpback whale in 1980 um, started doing a new behavior 
which hadn't been seen before, feeding behavior, uh, lobtail feeding. And this was um, evidently the result of putting two other behaviors, one of which was a feeding behavior called bubble net feeding, and the other was a social behavior, lobtailing, together, and did the lobtail, then the bubble feeding. But by doing the lobtail in, in, a, in a way which was not to do with sociality, but was to do with feeding, and combining it with a bubble net feeding, um, managed in certain circumstances, presumably to get uh, better rewards from its feeding activity. And then you could see this, this spread through the population over the next few years. So in that sense, um, it's cumulative because you're taking two behaviors, both learned almost certainly from other whales and putting them together and making a new one. Now that's a long way from an iPhone. But it, 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 it does fit the cumulative culture uh, definition, yes. Um, yeah. So I, I think if you take it, it it's, um, you know, as if you define cumulative culture as that, other animals do it. Obviously, they have, there's nothing like what modern humans have got to. And even humans of a few thousand years ago. But if you look at where humans were a few hundred, hundred thousand years ago, then it, you know, the differences are, are much less obvious. So there's been this extraordinary, remarkable um, uh, explosion of human cumulative cultures over the tens of thousands of years, and it's accelerated, obviously, and it's now going nuts. But uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> And that's a that's yeah. a big puzzle why that that happened <laughs> yeah that's really fascinating uh, and are there any examples of the phenomenon that is called gene culture coevolution in these whales that you study <laughs> yes there is so this is i mean gene if you, you can think of um a culture as a an inheritance system, a, w a way in which uh, information goes from one animal to another, right? So through social learning, one animal watches another or in other ways interacts with it and gets information which changes its behavior. So it's an inheritance system whereby the behavior of one animal becomes more like another. Um, and, and that's, and, and genetics is clearly an, inher an inheritance system too, where information, the genes in one animal go to another, or two animals go to another. And um, so you've got these two inherited systems running through the population, where the animals here have, down here, have um, genes and cultures um, that they have learned or got because uh, you know, when they were conceived, the, they received the genes from other generations, or in the case of culture, from the same, sometimes from the same generation. So, uh, in a population, you can see these, you can think about these streams of inheritance running through. What I'm interested in, in how they affect one another, how the cultural stream affects the genetic stream, how the genetic stream affects the cultural stream. Um, and in particular, we're interested in the first of those, how the cultural stream may affect the genetic stream. And, and people have been interested in this um, from the human perspective for a few decades. And, and the most uh, prominent example is the, uh, the genes that allow adults to um, uh, absorb milk. And this is typically, is ancestrally, we go back enough human generations humans couldn't do this, right? So they absorbed milk when they were, when they're, they're infants and they're suckling uh, from their mothers, but then as they get older, they're not able to do this. However, in dairy farming uh, cultures, uh, and separately in places like Europe and Africa, um, the genes which allow humans to absorb milk have been, uh, have been selected. And so we get, uh, populations of humans which have a, the dairy farming culture, because dairy farming is a culture, it's a way of life learned from others, um, but 
they have these particular genes which allow them to absorb milk as an adult, so those fit together nicely. In the whales, there's a wonderful study of killer whales. Um, now, killer whales uh, have culturally uh, ha have have societies somewhat like the sperm whales, which are uh, culturally divided into different, um, uh, in, in this case, matrilineal uh, units at the very lowest level, to pods, to uh, 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 communities, to clans, to communities, and at the very top level of, of killer whales are ecotypes. And these are, we're pretty sure, culturally set up divisions of, of, of society, but they're much deeper than the sperm whale clans. Um, because what has happened, which hasn't happened with the killer whale, with the sperm whale clans, is these, in these killer whale ecotypes, the they have started mating only within the ecotypes. So the clans of sperm whales mate across, but in the e killer whale ecotypes, they mate within. And this means that the, not only the cultures maintained in these ecotypes, but also the genes start being maintained in the ecotypes. And this sets up a situation where you can get uh, the cultures of the ecotypes can set up selection for particular kinds of genes. Mm -hmm. and, and in this um, study, they looked at this and found that uh, in both the North Pacific and in the Antarctic, there live side by side ecotypes who eat fish, ecotypes who eat mammals, you eat seals, and dolphins, and so on. And they found that um, there has been selection for particular genes which help the animals will digest to digest mammalian meat um, in both the mammalian mammal eating ecotypes in the Antarctic and in the North Pacific, and even more that they are they receive more or less the same result, but through different genetic means. Right, so there's been uh, independent selection in the mammal eating ecotypes for genes which which help them digest mammals. So this is, in some ways, an even clearer case than the human one. Um, and, and there are other, other instances of this, too. Um, gene culture can co-evolution can, can do other things. And so there's a, r a remarkable case of the dolphins um, in, in Shark Bay in Australia. And, and these, um, if you look at the, in this case, the distribution of a neutral gene, a gene that doesn't affect, um, you know, behavior or or uh, any sort of physiological and anatomical characteristics, just a gene that happens and gets passed along, but doesn't really seem to do much, if anything, um, or all well, the different variants of it don't change anything. Um, if you take these neutral mitochondrial genes which are passed through the mother, on a scale of a few kilometers, e e e, there's a huge difference. So inshore, the, the dolphins there tend to have a, two or three uh, kinds of these mitochondrial genes. Offshore, just a few kilometers, the dolphins could get there in, you know, an hour or less, half an hour. Um, you've got animals with a very different uh, mitochondrial gene. And this seems to relate to the behavior. The ones offshore are learning different ways of feeding from their mothers primarily than the ones inshore. So you set up this genetic um, difference um, from the culture, from the information that the young dolphin is learning from her mother. Um, and there are other ways where we yes. seem to have cultural gene culture coevolution um, right across uh, species, but a lot of the best examples are in the whales and dolphins. And the, I think a reason for that uh, is that, uh, you know, A, they have this very strong dependency on their mothers. So you've got this, you know, flow of cultural information through the maternal line, which becomes really important. And um, secondly, you have no barriers. So it's easier to say, okay, this is, you know, these animals live basically, these dolphins could just move across, the sperm whales are in the same area as each other. Um, so it's not that these animals 
happen to be stuck on this island or those animals on that island. It's because of their culture that has caused this separation. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you another question now. Um, by studying these behaviors of these kinds of whales and, for example, their culture and their cultural behavior, do you think it's possible to establish the evolutionary history of culture and establish some sort of <laughs> phylogenetic basis for culture and even uh, relate it to the culture that we see in great apes, including humans, and so it could help us better understand the phylogenetic basis of culture and how our own culture works, in a sense. I think we can do some of that. I think we need to be careful, though, because... Yeah. <coughs> Um, it's much easier to recognize culture in some social systems than others. Okay. So one of the reasons I, I study matrilineal social systems is it make is that it makes it easier to study to study culture. And so, for instance, our best information on the culture of whales and dolphins comes from another matrilineal species, the killer whale, which I was just talking about. And so there we can quite easily often identify these matrilineal uh, social units or other structures up to the clan. And then we can, you know, uh, and then we can uh, relate these, we can map different behaviors onto these and get a feel for how culture works. In other species which have a different social system, um, which are say more like my northern bottlenose whales or the bottlenose dolphins which are where the females have a much more uh, uh, diffuse social network it doesn't mean it's any less important but it's not so clearly um, set up based on on kinship um, it is a lot harder to map the culture um, how it spread how it moves through the social system. This it has been possible in a few cases, such as those bottlenose dolphins in, in, in Australia, um, but it, it, and the humpback whales learning the lobtail feeding. But it, it it is a harder business. So our tendency tends to, you know, we, if we look at the evidence now, we'd say there's a lot of evidence for culture in killer whales, quite a lot in sperm whales, and uh, and that relates to these matrilineal things. Uh, whereas we do know now from, say, studies of great apes that there can be species which are ostensibly not all that social, like uh, orangutan, right? Which is an animal uh, where we, you will often see them alone. They're not always interacting with others, as, for instance, chimpanzees tend to be. Um, but if you do the detailed studies, get to know the orangutans well enough, they also have important cultural lives. They learn a lot of important information from each other, even though they don't spend a lot of time with each other. Um, but, uh, you know, finding that's only possible because um, people spent a lot of time watching the orang orangutans. And, you know, for instance, animals like minke whales, which to us seem more solitary, um, culture may be really important. And at the other end of the scale, uh, if you go way offshore, you tend to find uh, there are species of dolphins which are found in huge groups, hundreds, thousands. And we really have no idea what's going on in those groups. And I suspect there's a lot of cultural information, but how do we get a hold of it in these extremely uh, complicated, extremely numerous societies uh, where you can't typically get to know individuals well. So um, I think you're right if we can get an idea of uh, the different extensive cultural information in the different species, it will tell us a lot about evolution and it would be great. But I think we need to be really careful because at the moment, the way we collect that information is extremely biased towards different kinds of um, social setups, especially. Mm -hmm. I understand.
Okay, so okay. let me just ask you about one last topic that is also one of your interests. Uh, let's talk a little bit about whale conservation. So, uh, I mean, with uh, all of this knowledge about their behavior, sociality, their culture and so on, how important it is it for us to know this, to really uh, bring about good conservation measures for these whales? Well, the, 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 the whales uh, have a, a somewhat different conservation. And here I'm mainly talking about the larger whales uh, status from most species. So for most species, they were doing okay. There were a few issues, but now things are getting really tough for them as humans are, are sort of uh, uh, really asserting our dominance over the globe and affecting all ecosystems and pretty much everywhere. Yeah. With the whales, it, it happened rather differently because um, they are, because of some of their attributes, extremely valuable or were and still are valuable to us. So, uh, you know, we started whaling fairly early, back several centuries. Mm -hmm. And as humans got their industrial systems going, particularly in sort of the 17th and 18th centuries, whaling became an increasingly important part of our commerce. And in the 19th century, it became, a, you know, it was one of the very biggest industries out there. So um, the whalers from Nantucket and New Bedford and other ports um, in the United States, in England and France and so on, were going all around the world catching sperm whales, right whales. And the oil that they were bringing back was, in the early part of the 19th century, the, the, the main part, uh, you know, a major part of the Industrial Revolution. Right. So that oil was being made into things. It was lubricating the machines that were making things and so on. And um, so a large proportion of these animals were killed. In the late, the, the value of the whales went down a bit when we found other oil that we could use, in, you know, from, from underground. Um, but at about the same time in the late 18th, 70s, 1880s, we developed a whole new suite of catching of methods of catching whales, which meant we could catch them much, much more easily. And uh, so if you look at the progression of that, by the 1960s, there were very few large whales left in the ocean. Some of the species were down to a few hundreds, even a few tens of animals. Um, things were really, really bad in the 60s. And if you look at the biomass of large whales in the ocean, it was going towards zero. If you take, say, 1967, um, you know, they, they, humans were exploiting the whale populations in completely unsustainable whale ways. And if you follow the curve downwards, there wouldn't have been any whales by about 1985. Um, they, these were animals we had really good technologies. They were easy to kill. They were valuable. They were just being slaughtered everywhere. And then in the 1970s, a remarkable change in our culture came out because we switched from seeing these whales as a source of margarine and pet food and so on. Um, particularly when these, uh, the, um, we started hearing the songs of the humpback whale. We started seeing television programs about dolphins. Uh, we changed our perception of these animals in the 1970s. And that got through to the politicians who were already getting a message from population biologists that there was a real disaster happening with the whale populations. But politicians don't tend to listen to population biologists, you know, they listened to their voters, and the voters were listening to the songs of the humpback whales. They were watching these TV programs about dolphins. And so somehow we humans got our act together in the 1970s and basically, not quite, but nearly stopped all this. So you get these populations which are incredibly low in the 1970s. 
and now we have a picture where some of them have rebuilt so for instance humpback whales have done really quite well all around the world um and there are other populations which like fin whales which don't seem to have done too badly um, in contrast other species like the northern right whale that uh, is still in desperate shape blue whales are looking pretty bad uh, sperm whales it's kind of unclear what's going on there's no obvious sign of rebuild rebuilding since the end of whaling but uh, they weren't dropped as low as some of these other species. So we now have a situation where uh, many of these species uh, should be rebuilding from what happened, but they aren't. Part of this, uh, they aren't, some of them aren't, and part, so, some of this may be cultural. So for instance, some of these species, they may have depended on, um, well, we're thinking of right whales who um, use they need very specific feeding grounds where their food these uh, zooplankton these large plankton are very dense indeed and they need a network of that because if this area isn't good then you can go over here and so on and there's a suspicion that with the reduction of the right whale populations to a few tens of individuals that some of the knowledge may have been lost so, for instance, that happens with human populations, with Aboriginal populations. When they get really low, not only are they losing genetic diversity, but they're losing cultural diversity too. And and they, these can be really important for them. So, um, uh, we have a situation now where the big threats of whaling are largely gone, but there are modern threats. The oceans are becoming noisier. They're becoming increasingly polluted with things like plastics. Um, if there are more and more ships out there to hit the whales to produce the noise, and um, and, and we have some populations which are, are really low as a relic of a relic of whaling. So it's a different, a difficult conservation situation for these animals. Um, you know, it isn't a, in some ways, I would say, as dire as it is for some terrestrial populations where the animals aren't able to move. And as global warming kicks in, you know, whales are naturally mobile, so they can potentially move around, but whether they can find new areas which, you know, contain the resources they need, um, whether they can avoid the new threats we're putting in the ocean, the plastics, the noise, and so on. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a it's a tough time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I hope that things get better in the future for the whales that are at least under risk. So, uh, Doctor Whitehead, let's end the interview here. But just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet or elsewhere if they want to get in touch with your work? Yeah, well, we we have a, 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 a website at Dahazi um, University, which uh, um, has a little bit about our work. And um, one of the wonderful things at the moment you can do on the internet is uh, find extraordinary images and videos of whales. Um, many years ago, I, you know, when we I started doing this 40 years ago and we, we, we would photograph them and after a bit we'd try videoing them and uh, you know and sometimes people would use these pictures and put them in magazines and so on um, but uh, because there weren't very many people out there but now there are extraordinary images appearing all the time on the internet and uh, we have stopped taking pictures just to illustrate things unless something truly extraordinary happens but usually someone else has seen that and has a wonderful picture with a wonderful piece of camera and you know, with a mindset set up for that um so you can go on the internet and just google sperm whales underwater and see extraordinary things these animals socializing you know these are tactile animals you see them moving and listen to their sounds these patterns of clicks um, it's pretty wonderful, yeah. And so do that. 
you know, get you can get a, a bit of a feel for them. You can't yet really see them feeding deep underwater, but you can see they're socializing. You can see what they're how, how they interact with each other at the surface. It, it's wonderful. Okay. So I'm links in the description box to your work and to sum up that so that people can go and watch. I guess it's very interesting. So Dr. Whitehouse, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show, and it was a real pleasure to everyone. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with leading intellectuals from around the world. And so, to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You can also support me via PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Drs. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, my four producers, Isar Webbe, Rosie, Jim Frank, and Lucas Stafiniak, and my executive producer, Michel Rogieski. Thank you for all.